Hi, and welcome to Newsmakers for inside analysis and behind the scenes commentary about the most important news events in our community from Santa Barbara's top journalists and political leaders. I'm Jerry Roberts. Tonight, we look behind these headlines. A new investigation of the Thomas fire points the finger directly at Southern California Edison. Vintners square off with pot growers in Santa Barbara County's economic marijuana wars. With more than $100 million in city construction at stake, a renewed battle over who will get the work. And will the selection of a new principal mark a turning point in the saga at San Marcos High School? Our panel tonight, Tyler Hayden, senior editor of the Santa Barbara Independent. Nick Welsh, executive editor of the Indy. Josh Molina, political writer at Newshawk, and Laura Capps, vice president of the Santa Barbara School Board. Thank you all for good. Did you know she was a vice president? I did not. Yeah. Well. Good news. Okay. <laughs> she's, got, she's got her eyes on the big job over there. <laughs> so, uh, Tyler, more than a year after the Thomas fire, the Ventura County Fire Department investigators are out with a report that appears to establish definitively that Edison's power lines were the cause of the fire. What does the report say and will it be the final word? So I think it's important to start off knowing that there were two specific starting points of what became the Thomas fire. Uh, they were both in sort of the general uh, Ojai, uh, uh, Santa Paula area, but um, this specific investigation focused on uh, the, the starting point in what, what they refer to as Anlauf Canyon. I'm not pronouncing it right, but it's like A-N-L-A-U-F. So the Ventura Fire Department studied the, the equipment there, uh, studied the, the 911 calls, um, did a full investigation and determined, uh, along with Cal Fire investigators, I should say, um, and Santa Barbara County investigators, they determined that that point of ignition was caused by two Edison power lines slapping together in the, in the high winds uh, and creating a, an arc and then some kind of hot material could have been molten aluminum could have been a spark could have been fire itself falling into brush and starting the fire so that was one uh, starting point and what's what's significant about this is edison has basically already admitted to uh, its equipment being responsible for the second starting point so if this report is accurate and edison was right about the you know about its own findings then they would be completely on the hook for starting. The but are they fire. pushing back though? Yeah, they're, they're, they're pushing back hard against the Ventura uh, Fire Department's investigation, saying that these guys uh, you know, botched evidence, they didn't uh, sort of follow the proper chain of evidence uh, procedures, that they withheld evidence from their attorneys, um, that they didn't look at the right uh, uh, data that show the smoke plume was in the area sooner than when the fire supposedly started. So Edison's saying this is completely wrong. We disagree with it. We're going to battle this out in court. Um, but that's so that's kind of where things stand. It was a pretty, I mean, the, the 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 report was published, and you know, within a couple hours, Edison had this long rebuttal statement. That so they probably knew it was coming. They knew it was coming, but I, I mean, it was it was striking their um, their vehemence uh, and sort of. So so they're acknowledging one, they're denying the other. Right. So that would significantly reduce their liability, or presumably, I mean, it, that's a good question, though. I mean, the, the two incidents, um, I don't know how it's going to it's going to play out in court because even though they started separately, they merged together and became what was referred to as the Thomas Fire. So I don't know if you start one and not the other, how you determine how much that starting point contributed to the final giant. And then fire. does that then? Through the the chain, then go eventually to the mudslide to the yeah. to debris flow. Yes, exactly. So, so because the Thomas fire directly set the stage for the debris flow. If they are found liable for the fire, they will also be found liable for the for the debris flow and all the destruction and all the, the death that came from it. Now, up north, Pacific Gas and Electric, not that far north, is in bankruptcy. I mean, they are yeah. they're just uh, the New York Times had a huge story today about their lack of safety and their culture and so yeah, on. Yeah, the, the Paradise is, is, Fire. Is it at all clear whether Edison's a bad actor like that or not? Not yet. I mean, the, the, yeah, that story was pretty, uh, was pretty remarkable. I mean, it showed the, the timeline of all of uh, PG&E's sort of, um, you know, cutting corners and, and lying to regulators and so on and so forth. And the Paradise Fire, you know, as terrible as it was, that was really only the latest in a whole yeah. string of, string of uh, errors. So I... 
I think it's too soon to say if, if Edison is in that same ballpark as far as uh, just bad practice and, and you know, uh, and, and liability. Uh, so, but this is, this is not looking good for them. They, they don't, don't they have the authority to pass on? Now they do. The they, cost to us? So, so a bill recently passed in, in Sacramento that would um, allow utilities to pass along the co whatever costs they incur from, from these liability lawsuits onto the customer. So Edison would be able to, to take advantage of that. So it gets into this strange territory where you want to hold the utility responsible and call them out for making a mistake, but if you do that, then you as the customer might wind up paying for that mistake. Yeah. So, and they're not headed for bankruptcy. They haven't said, they haven't said that, um, <sighs> though the, the president did ha had a really interesting interview with the Los Angeles Times uh, a couple weeks ago where he said they're one wildfire away from, from bankruptcy. Well, fortunately, the drought's over, I guess. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Yeah. <laughs> so, all right, well, more work for lawyers. That's a good thing. All right, Nick, so uh, what are hoop houses? And why are they the latest <laughs> flashpoint I know, in really. the county's battle over legal marijuana cultivation? I know. I, I remember when I first heard about hoop houses. It was Kelsey Kyrie. Bruger, I believe, yeah, the late she, was, yeah, like, she was why, a millennial like you, Joe. Why are we even talking about this? And who really cares? And at the time, there was a proliferation of hoop houses, mostly because of berry growers. And it really, it, it started because there's this hydroponic tomato grower up in, in San Maria area. He's got this huge greenhouse operation, and he decided, I want to do hoops. And he was one of these sticklers for regulations, and that one, the county regulations and codes are sort of in conflict about what do you do if you want to get a hoop permit where well, you have to apply as a greenhouse. Well, that doesn't make any sense. It's a, it's a you know, agricultural device. It's not a structure. So there's this big battle, and let's just try to... Get what are hoops made of? Plastic? plastic. White they're, plastic. They're, it's like white plastic. And um, they, they shield the plants and the people who work under them from the sun. They keep, they're, they're much more efficient in terms of irrigation. Uh, they're said to be quite effective in terms of targeting um, you know, for pesticide application and fertilizers and um, wind. So they're, they're definitely a highly utilitarian function. And nobody really cared about these or thought about them until recently where in the saying as value you start seeing a proliferation of outdoor cannabis grows. Uh, they're quite large and um, covered in hoops. And now all of a sudden, oh my God, the hoops, the hoops, they're here. Because of the, the wine growers. It's and, and, ruining and, the ambiance or what well, is it? What they call the terroir. The war on uh, T E R R O I R. And I don't know what that terroir? means. Terroir? Terroir? <laughs> Did you study what French? Did you anyway, know it is, it's, if I was a viticulturist, I could tell you, but I don't. So, but I just know it's hilarious. The sensibility, <laughs> of, the, the sensibility of the earth. It's a sensibility of something. But <laughs> if, if you have a, a tasting room where supposedly 78% of all wine is sold up there, um, you want your customers to come in and not have any intrusion into their olfactory experience. Now, not to mention their visual. Uh, the visual is a significant one, but the most there's something about the pot terpenes that really sort of get in there. And the deal, though, with the with the scent is, okay, that's about ten days a year in where the where the uh, cannabis flowers are in bloom and the odor is really pungent. So. They do happen to be high tourist times a year, so that's an issue. I think the other issue, though, is the visual. The hills are alive with the rolling sound of hoops. That is not the, the sound of music scenario that we want in San Diego that brings 1.5 million right. visitors a year. So the hoop. So the so the soups are presented. The soups and the hoops. So yeah. So so, so the wine growers are trying to get the um, pot growers in the planning commission. They were trying to get uh, regulations passed that would <clears throat> require cannabis growers to go through all kinds of permitting processes the rest of agriculture didn't because pot really isn't agriculture. It's not food, it's a, it's regular. 
But it can't be, but... Josh, Josh will agree with me. On but that. it's not a food crop. So they were making the argument it's not a food crop. So something which should have been kind of a simple thing took seven meetings, eight months, was just a knockdown drag out in the Planning Commission to get to the Board of Supervisors, mostly because Steve Lavanino, I think, County Supervisor, said, enough, bring it to us. Um, and Where was, is he on the hoops? Uh, well, he's very pro-hoops and very pro-cannabis. And he, you know, and the supervisors wrestled with it for five hours before they finally came to sort of... Did you a, cover that meeting? I covered that meeting. Were you getting paid by the hour? I was getting paid by the second. <laughs> and, um, Overtime? Okay. Anyway, yeah. So, okay, so do you agree with me, though, that the supervisors led by Greg Hart and my new best friend, Doss Williams, are, are sacrificing, essentially the wine industry for their new best friends in, in the pot industry. I don't know if I would agree with that yet. I think that the um, wine industry was asleep at the switch when this thing was going through. There was a public process. They could have jumped in. You know, what they say now, uh, they say two things. One, we didn't have actual experience at that point. We didn't know what we were, were anticipating, and we didn't know that there was going to be so much cannabis. So this caught us by surprise. And what's interesting is now when you call up wine industry representatives, they will sometimes say, or a lot of them will say, this has to be off the record because I don't want to acknowledge there's a problem. Because right. if, if I oh. say that there's a problem on the record, that means you might not show up and drink my wine, and that's bad for business. So, they, so when I call them up, there's this whole sort of don't ask, don't tell sort of going on. But then they go in front of the Board of Supervisors. What is the most interesting thing, and they have brought it out more than anybody, is the extent to which Santa Barbara County will be by far the tallest that, I mean, tree. That's astonishing. Just, it is, we are going to be the tallest tree in the forest when it comes to cannabis in California. Governor Newsom just said, hey, dude, we are going to send 150 National Guard people up to Northern California to go smother those illegal growers. This has got to be legal. Well, we don't have the most cannabis being cultivated. We have the most legal ca cannabis. Mm -hmm. And when all these you know, hoops and, are gone through and all the, the, the dance of legalization takes place, we're going to have more cannabis. We're the only county that has no cap on how much cannabis can be run. That is unique to Santa Barbara. And so, that happened because? That happened because, well, there was a state regulation that had caps at the time, so it didn't look like we needed it. But then all of a sudden, that language magically disappeared because of some really good lobbying that took place in Sacramento. So the sky was the limit. Santa Barbara County did not have any big appetite for caps. So let me say that. We had a board of supervisors that looking at, we want to get this industry up and going because it will be lucrative. Now, here's the thing that really came out that was most interesting to me because I'm listening to Steve Lavanino, Pitts District Supervisor, and he's expanding the chessboard massively in my understanding. And he's sort of alluding to the fact that in a few years, <clears throat> cannabis is going to be legal federally. And there will be interstate commerce of cannabis. And so if, if you're thinking about Santa Barbara production for the state market, that's one thing. But if you're thinking about Santa Barbara production for a national market, that is so much more lucrative. Except there is a lot of pushback, excuse me, from the grassroots right now, led by our good friend Andy Bardock and Carpinteria and Golita. Didn't Golita say no to uh, uh, all the shops there this week, as I read at Newshawk? So, it wasn't my story. <laughs> <laughs> there, you read the paper? There's definitely pushback, and they will have to deal with it. Um, I think the issues in Carpinteria are technically solvable. I think the ones in the San Inez are going to be trickier. Right. Well, I'm, I'm just curious about the economics. Uh, if you look at the wine industry versus what we think the tax revenue will be. And I was just talking to Peter Rupert of, about this with the economic forecast project, but what are the numbers? I mean, do we know, is this, I mean, do, are we putting up with this white blight because the numbers are gonna be so white, over- White, nice. That's story. what they're calling nice it from, from Nick's story. But, uh, you know, because the numbers are so good for the county, I just haven't seen them. Um, you know, the numbers are all over the map. It's, um, the county estimates 
you know, they're saying we're expecting anywhere from five to twenty-five million dollars a year. There is an interesting pushback, though. I mean, for people who've been around a while, when the wine industry really came in in 1990. Um, they were the big bad boogeyman, and they were raping and pillaging the landscape, and they were just—they were destroying it, and wholesale slaughter of the oaks, and it was—and it was visually really um, stunning. So but it look, smelled a lot better. Yeah, but but and, uh, then, but, and then sideways was filmed here. And then sideways. Exactly. Right. So but, we but, need sideways for a pot. Well, would there be sideways with the with white hoops? Who would play Annie Bardo? <laughs> but but here's the thing that people you know. You know, wait, okay. I went up and visited. Right, quickly. I went up and visited this woman named Sarah Rotman, and you know, here she is, this high-end fashionista, and she's got two acres going on fifteen. Yeah, yeah. This what, is the lead of your piece. This is what, what's going to happen here is we're going to have high-end tourism, pot-driven tourism, and you know, the people are going to be staying at the Rosewood, and they're going to be. Going up in the Sandy Nez and doing pot tours or cannabis tours, just like they do wine, and I think that there right. is a complementary. I mean, hmm. if there's complementary. They would they could combine the two. You know, they would have some, yeah, that's some a good idea. Pinot followed by <laughs> yeah. some sativa yeah. paired with some get cheese, round, you know? yeah, Go yeah, on yeah. Santa and Nez. Combine forces. <laughs> get uh, your swirl on. I mean, Santa and I mean, right now that's being resisted for good right. reason, but it, it's going to happen. All right. That's going to go on forever. All right, Josh, uh, you reported exclusively in NewsHawk uh, that the city has $130 million of construction projects underway or in the pipeline. And before Supervisor Greg Hart left the city council, he made sure the fix was in for building trades unions to get most of the work. The city council had an opportunity to uh, undo that this week, and they failed miserably. What happened? So Greg Hart's proposal to have the city contract with uh, companies that only hire unionized workers went before the council yesterday. It was a step along the way. They decided that they were going to pay about $94,000 to two different consultants to help develop a, what's known as a project labor agreement and for technical services. That was what was before the council. And Greg Hart had proposed this before he had left. And well, proposed would be to put it by. I mean, he jammed it through is what he did. Yeah, he, he rushed the city staff to come up with a proposal. And they did. And they took it to the council. And it passed. The, it's not done. It, it, the details have not been worked out. But there is a majority support to draft some type of project labor agreement for projects $5 million or above. So you say here in your story, you quote Councilman Rouse, Randy Rouse, in my nine years on the council, the path that this took to get here represents a low watermark for me on the council. What are we trying to fix? Who in the city will benefit? I've never seen such a rush into such a major policy issue in my nine years on the council. So when they took the vote on Greg's original proposal, the council was divided. It was a 4-3 vote. I, what happened to Kristen Snedden, who, who bailed on her opposition? Jason, uh, who knows? And then Megan, uh, the, the Harmon, the, 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 the new member who may have been the most disappointing of all, whatever her head scratching well, comments how, meant. How quickly you turn on your favorites, Jerry. Um, well, they don't do the right thing. What can I tell you? So. so Randy Rouse said it was a low mark. And you would uh, agree, having watched mark. the council, would you not? It was a good meeting. I, I enjoyed it. It was very entertaining. No, but, no, but he's talking about the process of how that happened. That, it was it, extraordinary. It, it, well, well, it's a little bit credit to Greg Hart, because Greg Hart is very smart. He's very politically savvy. He's, he's very politically, he's, he has a, he's really politically <laughs> savvy. And he's got he had a lot of clout, a lot of cachet, and he cashed in before he left. The he city staff in. love him. Because he's somebody, he, you know, he was a staffer at SPK. He can talk on their level, and he can do all the research, and he can explain it as well as they can. So, so when he suggests something, it comes with a lot of uh, support from the staff. So they researched it, and then they brought it forward. 
Kristen initially was very opposed to it. She's a Democrat, but she's got some very sort of, you know, she's, she's basically a socially liberal Democrat, and she leans sort of right on some of the fiscal policy issues. Uh, environmental, she's very to the left. So she had some difficulties with it. Uh, the issue is, should companies have to hire unionized right. workers or can they just hire the workers who are also trained and capable? And, and all of the major contractors right. in Santa Barbara are non-union operators. Probably, what, 90, 95% of the workers are not. And they keep saying this is this is a good thing for Santa Barbara, but it's not. It's a good thing for, this, for the Labor Council, which is in... Ventura, San Luis Obispo, and, and I mean it's a much broader thing. It's not the, locally the, focused. Yeah, the argument is that the private con or the contractors who hire their own workers theoretically are going to hire at the l lowest possible rate that they can to get the work done, and they're going to choose who they hire. If you go through the union, there are some protections that could be worked into this project labor agreement, which say you have to hire women. Uh, or, or you you uh, can hire women, you can hire uh, ethnic minorities, and you can hire veterans. Right, right. And it's a blind hire. So if I don't like the way Tyler looks, I can't discriminate. I don't know what Tyler looks like. Uh, whereas with some of these other jobs, there's that sort of subjectivity but that's that just comes to say, with I mean, it. That's an argument that's chasing the thing. That was not an argument that was brought up originally. That just, Nobody made it. That, no. that just came up. I don't know why Kristen changed her mind. Quite honestly, she looked a little bit flustered by the moment. Uh, I think she, the fact that there are blind hires that would favor women and minorities and veterans appealed to her, she said that. Uh, Megan Harmon uh, said, I get to come at this with fresh eyes. I wasn't part of the decision. And, yeah. and so she said that this is a process vote. She said that the time to talk about this has passed, the time to talk about it is ahead, but today is a <laughs> process. lies ahead process vote. The, the, the thing with that, though, is, you know, is every, every step every of the way step, exactly. leads to the final result. And so um, if, if she wanted to take a stand there, she could have. Uh, but by supporting it, it's, it's just it gets harder and harder to undo it the, the further you, you well, go. Well, this was the point at which to undo it, wasn't it? No, this was not the point to undo it. This was a, a, a molehill battle that was fought at the mountaintops. And it was really, it was a $95,000 procedural contract. And, and so um, if you wanted to send a message that we are changing, the wind is changing, this was a place you could have done it. But Well, that message was sent. It was just sent in the opposite direction. Well, I think that, yeah, I, I think it was very clear that, um, I mean, around City Hall, I'm sure you've heard the same thing, that, you know, city staff are, are reporting they have never seen such a display of, political force. The, the, the unions showed up, they lobbied very strong. They were not the only ones. Um, the contractors organized robocalls, and so they would get out there, they'd find people who were outraged, they would patch those calls directly into City Hall, and, and it was very intense, but it was very clear to, you know, this is a democratic town, the, the unions and the Democratic Party are very joined at the hip, and it was very clear to anybody who was thinking about having a political future that they would not have one if they voted against exactly. that's, so it. That's why Jay, Jason changed his mind. I was going to say, what did Jason? He's, this is an election year for Jacob, for uh, Jason. And Jacob. No. <laughs> He's going to Washington, D.C. with your grandson, oh, by the yeah? way. Uh, and so, uh, Kristen, I think she's just unsure. She doesn't quite know what to do yet, or if this is the well, right she's, time. Well, you know, she's, now she's saying, oh, well, the, you know, I, I wanted to be on the ad hoc committee, and then we can fix this all baloney. This is over. But, yeah, he, but here's the deal. Here's the question. We've got I mean, to move on. We have a situation where, you know, the middle class is shrinking, and the middle class is shrinking with the unions. And so if you are a part of a, of a political philosophy that says we need to increase unions in order to increase the middle class, this makes total sense. It's not like... You you are so intoxicated with the nefariousness of it that yes I, I am. mean it's just like okay but <laughs> that's our job Nick remember I mean but but at the that's same time intoxication you know Lots of intoxication. if you're trying to build up <laughs> a right. middle class you do have to increase the, that, that, I, okay we'll we'll talk more.
All right, Laura. So you have become a spokesperson what? for the plutocracy. I mean, we, should have, we should have a whole show on PLA. We, we will. And nobody okay. would watch. All right. So you stated earlier uh, this year that the selection of a new principal for San Marcos High would be the most important decision. And I know you try to soften it now and say one of the most, but that's not what you said at the time. Okay, sure. Most important decision the school board would take. So who did the board select? And will this end the discordant <laughs> atmosphere at San Marcos High? Dr. Kip Glazer will be our, the new principal at San Marcos High School starting the summer. I'm excited. I do think it is a new phase, I'm hopeful, for that school. Um, they've had a lot of disruption, a lot of turmoil. Um, she seems to be a wonderful choice. A panel of 35 teachers, parents, staff picked her. She was a clear winner. There was three apparently really strong uh, candidates. So, um, and she's got this, you know, impre very impressive background. So, and I'm, the board, the board signed off on. We it. did, we did. We had a special meeting last Thursday morning at 7:30 in the was morning. Was it unanimous? It was unanimous. Yes, five to zero. Did you get to meet with the? Uh... Um, no, we will meet her soon. Well, as is protocol. And, of course, there were a lot of questions raised by yourself and Kate Ford. Yeah, we pushed on the process to make sure it was as inclusive as, as possible. I wasn't 100% pleased with the process, but I think the end result is good. And the parents, apparently, who were part of that panel um, of 35 that took all day, uh, you know, felt good about the process. Um, some who were not, some parents who wanted to be part of the interview uh, panel weren't chosen, and I heard some grumbling from them, rightly so. Um, but, you know, I think it had a lot of integrity in the process at the end. Again, I think because the board pushed uh, to make sure that it was as inclusive as possible. Plus, they then spent a whole day with her at her school um, down in Los Angeles, two teachers and uh, some administrators. So it really got a sense of... So you think it's a good pick? Yeah, and I love, too, she has this connection to Santa Barbara. Um, she's from Korea, but she came here as a, um, a student to learn English when she was 23 and went to uh, football games at San Marcos. And then quickly... Uh, as the vice president of the Santa Barbara Unified School District, and I, you need to put that in your stories for now. On. You can just call Laura Capps, comma, the vice president. Yes. You're more or less personally responsible for the boondoggle at the stadium uh, I'm at a Santa Don. Barbara High. Yeah. Are, you, are you not? Once a Don, always what, a Don. What's going on there? I mean, how they much money are you going to pour down that round? They need a PLA to keep the caution. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We go. uh, you know, we just need to have some <laughs> that cannabis. Just knock the top off of that. <laughs> yeah, just have some hoop houses why, in why there. Is there. Oh, no, man. Yeah, there's a hoop Move out of the papers. Why, so. are you, why is there no control over that? It's delayed by a few months. I wish it weren't. It did uh, rain, it was it did rain a ton. It so really rather than being come done right before. 17 storms this season. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> yeah, a little, a little slack must be cut. Thanks for tuning in to the <laughs> Apology for Institutions show. <laughs> 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 And thanks to our guests, Tyler Hayden, Nick Welsh, Josh Molina, and Laura Capps. Thank you for watching. Please visit our website, newsmakerswithjr.com, to check out my blog posts on politics and media, and our YouTube channel, where you'll find an archive of past shows and interviews, should your insomnia be particularly troublesome. Thanks again to our director, J.P. Montavo, to our crew, Andrew, Mark, Tara, and Lizzie. And as always, our senior, top-ranking, high-powered, high-energy executive producer, Hap Freund. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.